Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another edition of DRIA Street Talk. I'm Jim Pamplin, co-chair of DRIA. Today I welcome uh, Kelsey Deneen of Midland Self-Directed IRA. Uh, now, Midland has been a member of DRIA for many, many years and we appreciate the education they bring us. But with the change in the market, you know, whether commercial values or investment properties go up or down, people are gonna be changing. And with accelerated depreciation, it could mean a tax bite. So I've invited Kelsey here to talk about 1031 exchanges. But first, Kelsey, let's let's open up with what Midland actually does. Sure, sure. Um, so Jim, I appreciate you having us here. Um, like you summarized, basically we're into tax strategies for real estate investors. So um, I think the most common tax strategy that a lot of people are familiar with is 1031 exchanges. And um, today we're going to talk about that in depth a little bit more. Um, we're a qualified intermediary for those. Uh, we also serve as a self-directed IRA custodian for uh, other investors who wish to use retirement funds. So that's really the two sides of our business, self-directed IRAs and 1031s, and we facilitate both. So tell us then, if an investor is facing a big tax burden uh, on, um, and hopefully they think to figure that part out, right? But if they're facing a big tax burden on a sale, what does an, a 1031 exchange do for us? Sure. So the first thing that people think of, and quite honestly, I, I get most of my calls after the investor has spoken with their CPA or tax advisor. And like you said, the, the CPA says, you know, we really accelerated the depreciation on this rental property because you didn't want to pay taxes, you know, when you were renting it. Now that you're selling it, basically the, the piper comes calling, you know, the government's going to want their tax money one way or another. So when you sell a property, an investment property, you're looking at things like capital gains tax. That's the number one thing most people think of. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes there's a kind of nasty surprise where it's not just capital gains. It's also things like depreciation or capture tax. Uh, if you've accelerated depreciation, sometimes there's state taxes. Um, lucky enough here in Florida, we don't have to worry about that. But there's plenty of investors who own property in northern states. And when they sell, they're, they're slapped with state taxes. So a 1031 will defer those as well. Um, and then for certain individuals with a certain amount of income for the year, um, you sometimes are exposed to a 3.8% health care tax as well. Um, that don't, doesn't always happen. It's a little less common. But if you're lucky enough to fall in that investor income bracket, uh, you're going to get hit with that. So a 1031 will defer all those taxes. Okay. So I know you're going to get into this, but I just have to ask it. I mean, we're talking about tax deferral. Isn't that just kicking the can down the road? <laughs> So there's actually two terms that we use. So we say you're either going to kick the can or you're going to kick the bucket. Ah. So what we mean by that is, yes, so a 1031 is a deferral strategy, meaning it's kind of like an IOU to the government saying, listen, instead of paying $50,000 in taxes this year from selling this investment property, I would rather hold on to that money and reinvest it. And basically, if you do that via a 1031, you're not paying that 50,000 tax bill. You're basically holding on to it. You still owe it to the government eventually if you if you don't do another 1031 when you sell your investment property. But it's like a free interest-free loan from the government where you're deferring the tax bill. You're not paying it now, you'll pay it sometime in the future. So the two strategies I mentioned was the first one is defer 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 essentially die. So nice. it's pretty pretty grim but if you are into estate planning it's really nice because you know when you pass away your heirs will essentially inherit that property at what we call the stepped up basis that's the tax term uh, that accountants use so the stepped up basis means you know you might have bought it as my father 25 years ago and paid next to nothing for it and when you sold it and did exchange after exchange you never paid capital gains taxes on any of those sales well, you've racked up a pretty big IOU to the government. Well, if you never uh, stop exchanging and you pass away, I inherit those properties, your entire basically real estate wealth at today's fair market value, the stepped up basis. What that means essentially is that tax bill passed away with you. You never had to pay it. And now myself as your heir won't have to worry about it either. Um, I could turn around and sell that entire portfolio of properties at today's value that I inherited it at and my gain would be nothing. I inherit at today's value, I sell at today's value, no tax bill. So that's a huge uh, estate planning technique that some folks will use. 
Now, if you want to touch the money before you pass away, which is some people's goals, um, what they'll do is basically uh, they'll defer it, defer it, defer it, and then eventually convert the property. And by convert, I mean you basically change it from investment use to your primary home. And uh, for anybody who's ever sold a primary home, you know, if you're in it long enough as your primary home, you are then basically allowed uh, the Section 121 exemption, which is the 250 if you're single, 500,000 if you're married filing jointly. You basically get to write off that amount from your sale. So um, people are allowed to convert exchange properties into their primary residences um, after a while. So that's another technique that some people will use. So what a great estate planning tool. I mean, obviously, all of us want to defer, defer taxes, but you know, if you've lived your life and collected a lot of building, it's nice to know that you know the piper will not have to be paid upon your death, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, what a great tool. So look, I'm going to turn it over and let you take us through you know, the, the definitions, the advantages, and a few of the myths about 1031 exchanges. Just let's let it go, Kelsey. <laughs> All right, sure. So quick synopsis of how a 1031 works. Um, besides the tax deferral, the other benefits are basically giving you flexibility. So many people don't realize how flexible a 1031 exchange is. So for example, um, you hear the term like kind thrown around a lot in 1031s. A lot of people interpret that as if I sell a condo, I have to exchange into another condo. Or if I sell a single family home, I have to buy another single family right. home. That's not the case at all. The government's actually very, very flexible about this. So they're more concerned about investment being basically the like kind. So are you using this as an investment property? So I can sell you know, raw land and exchange it into rental property if I want. I can sell commercial property and exchange it into you know, condominiums. As long as all these properties are being held for investment use, that's all that matters. So um, the benefits to exchanges besides obviously the tax deferral is the flexibility to move from different types of property, raw land to multifamily to commercial to whatever you're interested in without having to pay that tax bill. Um, so you're changing property types. Maybe you're exchanging into properties that are going to give you better cash flow. Um, maybe you're moving locations. So um, especially with COVID and everything going on right now, We've seen people no longer, you know, wanting to be in city or metropolitan areas and wanting to move out to maybe suburban areas. So mm -hmm. you as an investor, if you want to reposition yourself, you could sell that metropolitan property and exchange into, you know, a suburban property or properties uh, and be able to change locations without getting that smack on the hand and having to pay taxes from the sale. Um, so it, it's really very flexible and a lot of people don't realize that. And then some people, when they get retirement age, they just want to sell property that they don't have to manage anymore and exchange it into something that's low maintenance, um, awesome. or maybe something that they're hiring a professional property manager built in. So, um, it's just giving you options, really mobility as a, as a real estate investor. So I, I find it interesting that you say the government is flexible. I wrote that down. <laughs> I know, I know. I'll probably get a lot of feedback on that too. At okay. least, let me let me paraphrase. And at, at least in regards to 1031 exchanges, you know, there's hoops that you have to jump through, and we'll talk about those real quickly. But as far as what is considered like kind, you know, they're they're pretty flexible. I think it's pretty cool that you know I could sell a multifamily property and exchange into a single family rental if that's what I want to do. You know, it's just the ability to move asset, you know, however I wish, not get slapped with the taxes. So the other five basic things to think about when you do an exchange, number one is what we call the net selling price. So they, the government wants you to basically stay at the same value or go up when you exchange. So if I'm selling a property for 300,000, I have to exchange into an additional property or properties. Um, so I could sell one and buy two if I wanted. As long as I'm spending that net sell, selling price, which is essentially the sales price minus closing costs, that's all the government cares about. So you can't go down in size in a 1031 exchange. You have to maintain the same size or go up in size to not pay any taxes. Uh, if, for, if for any reason you go down in size, keep in mind, you'll just have to pay taxes on the difference. Okay. So net selling price, that's one thing to keep in mind when you're doing a 1031 exchange. The next one is what I hinted at when I said the government was flexible. So like kind. So 1031 exchanges have to be done on investment or business use property. 
So again, I can sell land, I can sell a condo, I can sell single family homes, I can sell multifamily, as long as I'm holding it for investment use, it's good to go. Now, if I was trying to sell maybe a vacation home or a, um, a secondary home that I personally use and I'm not using as investment, that's not considered like kind. So that's the difference really. So it has to be an actual property, real property, and it has to be for investment or business use. Um, some folks will ask me if maybe LLC interests. So for example, Jim, if you and I owned a property in an LLC together and I wanted to basically exchange the LLC ownership, can't do it. It's only going to work on the property itself. So it has to be real deeded assets. The next thing to be aware of, um, besides, like I said, net selling price and the fact that it has to be real property is the qualified intermediary. So think of that as your middleman who sets up the exchange for you. And that's what Midland does. That's why I'm you know, sharing all this information today, just from my personal experience in doing these. And believe it or not, the IRS requires that you have an intermediary. So they won't let you, know, your, you or your attorney or someone who's what they call an agent of yours do that. It has to be an independent third party who's going to facilitate your exchange. And what actually happens is when you sell that old investment property, instead of the sale proceeds being parked with you, they're parked with your intermediary. So you don't touch the money, you're not taxed on it. And the government's very clear as far as who cannot be your intermediary, cannot be yourself as a taxpayer, an agent of yours, like I mentioned, or a lineal descendant. So most people, when they're doing an exchange, will reach out to a professional QI, which is what Midland does again, and we'll guide you through the process. So very important that you have that intermediary set up and it has to be prior to closing. So make sure you know you're going to do an, a 1031 exchange before you go to closing and sign those closing documents to sell your property. All right, the hardest part of a 1031 exchange is the time limits. So the clock starts ticking the day you sell your old property. After you close on your sale, you have 45 days from that date to identify what you might purchase. And the government will let you identify three properties of any value, okay? You can go over three properties, but then you're subject to what they call a 200% rule, which means you can only identify 200% of the value of what you've sold. So again, easy numbers, I sell for 300, I can only identify 600, you know, 1,000 worth of properties. So identification period is the first deadline, 45 days. You, then your second deadline is 180 days. And again, it all starts day one when you close on your sale. So by day 180, you have to have purchased, closed on the purchase of those properties that you've identified to complete your exchange. There's no extensions, um, you know, no special, you know, people think when I file my taxes, I can file a tax extension. That's not how it works in the 1031, no extensions. They're very strict. So 45 days to identify and 180 total to close on your purchases. And whatever you've purchased, that counts towards your exchange. So no, no flexibility here, it's firm. That's firm, they're not flexible in that regard. <laughs> All right, um, also you have to make sure that it's essentially the same taxpayer. So this is most common with a husband and wife combination. So for example, maybe a wife purchased a property before she met her husband and they're ready to sell that property in exchange into a new investment property. Well, her husband can't jump on the deed because it has to be the same taxpayer who's selling the old property is the same taxpayer acquiring the new property. So that's something to keep in mind when you do an exchange. You have to be prepared to keep that taxpayer consistent. Um, and like I mentioned, so important that you get it set up prior to closing. Once you've signed those closing documents, it is too late. The title company or real estate attorney doing your closing will actually update all the closing documents to list you're doing an exchange, you have an intermediary, and that the money's not going to you, it's being parked by your intermediary so it's not taxable. So must be set up prior to closing. Um, other things that surprise people is that uh, there's no specific holding period. So the government won't let you basically flip properties in a 1031, uh, but they don't define an exact holding period. Meaning after I acquire a new 1031 property, they don't tell me how long I have to hold it before I can sell it and do another 1031. Most CPAs will recommend, and again, I'm not a CPA, so this isn't tax advice, but there's a two year safe harbor period. Meaning if you hold that property for investment use for two years, the government considers that their safe harbor and they won't question it when you sell it. 
So even though you can make a case by case, you know, uh, ex exemption or ask for, uh, you know, an excuse, I had to sell it ahead of time for some unknown reason. On average, what most people will say is a year and a day to two years uh, because there's a two year safe harbor rule. So make sure that you're not flipping 1031 properties. These are generally longer buy and hold type of properties. Okay. And I think that pretty much covers it. If you know those five things, you pretty much know, I would say 95% of how 1031 exchanges work. And believe it or not, they're pretty simple. Once you do one, uh, you, you start to learn the basics and doing an exchange after exchange, it's kind of addictive. People never wanna pay that tax bill. So they'll just keep on exchanging into new properties. So it's a really cool tax tool to help you basically save as much money as possible and reinvest it in more properties to keep your portfolios growing. So, so Kelsey, you mentioned like the husband and wife thing. That's really a great mm -hmm. example because life, life happens, things change. But mm -hmm. an LLC or a, a, an S corp or a C corp that owns property, that's no issue, right? No, not at all. So LLCs, S corps, all those, all those entities can do 1031 exchanges as well. What you're looking at is that the taxpayer remains the same. So for example, easiest thing is, let's say it's a single member LLC. So I own my property in a single member LLC. It's 100% owned by me. Really that LLC is me, I'm the taxpayer. So we have some people who will sell out of the name of one LLC and instead of buying in the same LLC name, because they usually will name it, you know, 123 Main Street, that's the property uh, that they own. So they'll name their LLC that manages it 123 Main Street LLC. When they go to exchange into a new property, they're like, oh, this is funny now because this property is, you know, 456 Apple Street. I don't want to call it 123 Main Street LLC as the owner. So what you are allowed is in single member LLCs, because it's just you, it's passed through entity, it's you who's the owner and you're the taxpayer. In those situations, you can change the LLC name uh, as long as it's single member. If you get into things like multi-member LLCs, that's different because now the taxpayer would change um, if you're changing, you know, folks and, or the or the corporation name. So case by case basis, just let me know what the details are and we'll guide you through it. But there are ways to kind of structure it and make sure you're sticking to those rules. Right. I, I would assume many of our, our viewers are going to own it in uh, a business type entity. Mm -hmm. So look, uh, Kelsey, uh, can people write to you at a Midland IRA? I see your information there. Uh, so if they want more information, they certainly visit the site midlandira.com and write to you with questions or uh, hopefully a lot of people are trying to sell right now. Hopefully. And, you know, you can start the exchange process as soon as you're under contract for your sale. That's actually when we encourage you to contact us because we want to make sure that we answer your questions and we get everything set up well ahead of closing. That way your title company and your real estate attorneys prepared, they know, already know all the instructions of how to update those closing documents. So if you're thinking about selling an investment property, number one, look into the tax bill, try to run the numbers or talk to your tax advisor. And if you're going to have a serious tax bill to pay, consider a 1031 exchange if your goal is to roll that money into more investment property. And you give me a call as soon as you're under contract for the sale and we'll start setting it up at that time. All right. Good pointers. Thank you. Thank you very much for being on Drea Straight Talk, and we hope to see you around Drea soon. We'll get back to live meetings hopefully in the fall, and we'll see you then, Kelsey. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye.